Hi, welcome to Wet Pixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of Wet Pixel, and we'd like to thank Inon today for sponsoring this episode. Inon produce a range of strobes, um, wet accessory lenses, um, arms, housings, and, and a whole bunch of other products. Please head on over to inon.jp. That's inon.jp to check out what they do and to show them some support. Um, I'm joined by our regular contributor, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Good to see you, Adam. And we thought we'd talk about some fundamentals today. And I thought I'd ask Alex, how do you use shutter speed to control exposure when you're taking pictures underwater? So big question. Over to you, Alex. Well, um, I guess by the, the, the flippant answer is by fiddling about with it. But, um, <laughs> I mean, Turning the dial. <laughs> shutter speed is one of our three main controls that we use over exposure in our pictures. Aperture, shutter speed and ISO. Yep. And shutter speed is, I think, one of the most important ones that can both affect greatly the look of our image, but also one that we need to get right to make our, our pictures work. Yep. So um, the shutter speed is, for those that, you know, um, uh, learning their photography, is how long the exposure lasts for. So how long the shutter is open for is okay. your shutter speed. And the higher the number, the shorter that time, because shutter speeds, you might see them written as 125 or 250th. It's actually a fraction of one over 125 or 150th. So the bigger the number, the shorter the exposure time. Yep. So um, a third of a second is click, click. Um, a 125th is click, you know, um, in terms of how long that shutter is open for you to take the picture. And obviously, so, the, long, the longer the shutter is open, the more light hits the sensor. Or film yes yeah so, yeah, yeah so 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 this is the this is the flip side so the longer you keep the door open the more light comes in the faster you open shut it the less light hits it sorry alex yeah yeah no no that's a really important point to make to anyone who doesn't understand shutter speed yeah. um i the other factor with shutter speeds is that the longer you leave the shutter open the more chance there is for things to be moving during that exposure and therefore not to be rendered sharp but if I move my hands like that, you can't see my fingers in detail. That's yep. not entirely to do with shutter speed, but it's it's because they're moving <laughs> too fast for the for them to be recorded um, properly um, within the exposure time. Yep. And so, if you want to freeze sharp movement, you need to use relatively fast shutter speeds. Yep. Now, the other factor that affects the sharpness of a picture, even if your scene is not moving, but you are not able to hold the camera still, and you mm. use a long exposure you will also get a, a blurry picture. Mm. So on land, for example, a landscape photographer might frequently take pictures over two or three seconds yeah. because they've got their camera on a tripod, their landscape is predominantly stationary, and yeah. with a good heavy tripod and a nice and good technique, you can take super sharp pictures over long exposures. Yeah. Underwater photographers, we're typically not using tripods, we're hand-holding our cameras, and therefore we need to be more careful on the shutter speeds that we choose. And so if we are choose shooting available light underwater pictures, for example, we might be shooting a shipwreck or a big school of fish or a reefscape yeah. or some divers far away, and we're shooting without flash on their subjects, or and I think this is what trips people up sometimes, we're shooting with flash, but our subjects are really too far away to get any flash on them. Mm. We need to be particularly careful with shutter speed. Yeah. Now, the good news for underwater photographers is that we dive in a, a viscous medium, and hopefully we are neutrally buoyant and our camera is reasonably neutral as well. Yeah. And with all that on our side, it's surprising that we can actually shoot really quite long exposures underwater handheld without the problems of camera movement um, during the picture, which which create a, a blurry picture. That camera movement is also typically called camera shake. It doesn't mean that you're shaking the camera. It means that actually you're just not able to hold it still during that exposure. So these so are, these are of, I'm sorry. These are these are potentially very, very small camera movements will result in shake. There's something else to point out. You know, we're not talking about waving a camera around. We're talking about a fraction of a movement is enough to provide it to provide blurriness in your image. So so, you know, it, it, the camera needs to be very still not to to have some form of, of, of blur in it. Yeah. So a rule of thumb that's quite widespread in photography is that try to keep your shutter speed um, similar or faster then the focal length of your lens, and this is designed for full frame photographers as a piece of advice. So if you're using a 100 millimeter lens and you are shooting an available light handheld picture, the, the rule of thumb on land is try to use a shutter speed faster than 100. 
it's yeah. harder to hold a long lens still than it is a wide viewing lens. Yeah. So if you're using a 20 mil wide angle lens, you might be able to shoot the snow as a 25th of a second on a stationary scene and actually render a relatively sharp image. Whereas if you're using a 100 mil lens, you need to shoot perhaps at 125th to get that same scene sharp. Those are generalist um, generalizations based on individual photographers. If you're a particularly good diver, you can stretch that shutter speed out. Um, yeah. And also underwater, we have the added advantage of, um, yeah, Adam's got big lines. We've got the added advantage that we're nice and neutral and damped in the water. And yeah. typically we're working with, with wider, wider lenses. Yeah. However, I think that that rule, it's a good learning rule for land photography. But I would say underwater, I wouldn't get too hung up on it. Hmm. Um, I would suggest if you're shooting available light pictures with a long lens underwater, you need to probably think about what technique you're trying, because generally longer lens, macro lens photos are taken with flash. Yeah. Um, and with the wider lenses, um, it's quite rare we, we photograph a scene underwater where nothing is moving. The ocean can sometimes be moving, but there's, there's only always fish or something moving around. Mm. So we generally, when we're shooting available light underwater, we don't want to use particularly long shutter speeds. Yeah. So I would say that a 90th to a 125th is a very safe place to be when shooting available light wide angle pictures. If you go slower than that, you run the risk of subject matter moving within the picture. Now, if you are in very dark conditions and you need to go slower than that, then you're going to need to go slower than that. Yep. Um, when shooting available light only. However, those are very good, safe values to go on. Yep. If you are shooting fast moving subjects like dolphins and things like that, which are very quick moving through the water, and also you may be panning the camera quickly to keep up with them, those are subjects where you really need to wind the shutter speed up higher. And yep. I would recommend getting up to at least a 250th yep. and with the faster moving dolphins, even a 500th of a second to be sure of capturing all the detail really sharp. So there's quite a range of shutter speeds we use even when shooting available light. Yep. If I'm inside a very dark wreck wanting to take a moody shot of maybe light beams coming through the ceiling, I will often look for something in the wreck to brace the camera on and then we'll take an available light picture of even several seconds yep. to get that stuff coming through. And as long as I'm holding the camera really stably, you'd be, you know, it's the same as putting it on a tripod. You'd yep. be amazed how slow you can go and still get really sharp, pleasing results. And actually, if the camera is, is, is sort of correctly weighted and comfortable in your hands, you can actually get pretty low shutter speeds mm. without even bracing. And I agree, you know, if, it, if once you get to sort of longer exposure, you've got to brace. But certainly, you know, you, you, can, you can actually shoot at quite slow shutter. Much slower, I can shoot with much slower shutter speeds underwater than I would on land. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah I think that's success. a very fair observation. Yeah. So um, now we come to the point of adding flash to our exposure. Mm. Now, flash is, from a photographic point of view, pretty much instantaneous. Mm. So adjusting our shutter speed doesn't really have any impact on our flash exposure. Over normal exposure settings, it has no difference. Yeah. It's only when we get to very extreme abnormal settings that it might have some influence. Yeah. But we still are using that our shutter speed to control the exposure of our picture. Now, in a typical underwater picture, we rely on our flash to light our foreground and we control that with the flash power and the flash power will only affect the flash and we control our background exposure primarily with our shutter speed and our shutter speed will therefore only affect the background. Now the other two exposure adjustments, aperture and ISO will affect both the flash and um, the background exposure. Yep. So typically in underwater photography, it's easier to use shutter speed when working with flash to control those backgrounds. Yep. The faster the shutter speed, the less light we're allowing in and the darker that background gets. Yep. The slower the shutter speed, the more light we're getting in and the brighter that background gets. And yep. ultimately, when we're shooting normal balanced light pictures, we want to choose a shutter speed that gives us a good exposure for the background so that we end up with a, an attractive watercolor, a bright background that invites the viewer to enjoy the background of the picture. Yep. So, yeah, so for me, that's the case. So. When I'm shooting wide angle underwater, I'm often making very small adjustments to my shutter speed, one click here or there, between almost every frame as I'm trying to really tune that background to be exactly the brightness I want. Whereas when I'm shooting macro underwater, I'm often just shooting black backgrounds or dive and my shutter speed will be set nice and fast and I won't change it or dive. So how much I'm changing, it does depend on the types of pictures that I'm taking.
we should also bring in another another um, salient point here, which is that most cameras, the vast majority of them, have a flash sync speed. Um, mm. And so um, unlike when we're shooting available light, where we can pretty much use whatever the camera will allow us to use um, in terms of fast shutter speeds, um, once we add a flash, all cameras will only sync, at, uh, uh, well, tend to sync at a, at, at a specific speed maximum. Um, so once you reach that 250th, 320th, whatever it is, um, then typically that's going to be your default setting if you're shooting black background macro or whatever it may be. And you can't go faster than that. Um, so it's important to know if you're using flash what your camera's flash sync speed is. Um, and, 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 and most of the time, if you have you're using a pop up flash or a trigger that's communicating properly with the camera, yep. um, or you've got the flashes wired in electronically, the system won't let you exceed that synchronization speed anyway. So you can keep trying to speed the shutter speed up, but it stops. Yep. And with some cameras sometimes. Well, the flashes are recharging, you might see it flash up, you can have a faster shutter speed, and then it, it jumps back down. I've been asked that question, why is my shutter speed, sometimes when I look through the viewfinder, it says 500th, and then it suddenly re jumps back down. And that's, but that, that's a fairly rare one. Um, yeah. But it, it can happen when that connection is not, is, is coming on and off as the flash guns recharge. Yeah. Um, now, an area that we can bend and break that rule is yeah. in the realm of high speed flash sync. Now, Adam and I, we've done a whole, video on high-speed flash sync on WetPixel Live. So we don't want to dive into all the minutiae of it today. Yeah. But high-speed flash sync is basically a mechanism that allows you to not be limited by that synchronization speed. And every underwater photographer can think of immediately advantages and times when they, they might want to go to a faster flash synchronization speed. So yeah. that's what the attraction of, of high-speed sync is. I think I think one of the things that's worth mentioning, though, is that, that high speed sync and I, I don't want to get too digress but one of the things mm. about high speed sync is that it's not really about fast action it's really more about when we've got a lot of ambient light and we want to we want to reduce the amount of ambient light for some mm. reason and um, so so you know I, I would tend to think it was not so much as a tool for dealing with super fast dolphins because I'm unlikely to get flashlight onto them anyway because they're probably not not close enough um but um but it's more when I'm pointing the camera at the surface and there's lots of lights around. And I, 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 I'm sure we will revert back on high-speed sync at some point, but I said there's a whole episode that we did. I think particularly when we back. both get the chance to dive in some brighter conditions and start using it a lot more, yeah, I think there'll yeah. be a lot more to say about it. At the moment, yeah. we've both been a bit limited on that. Yeah. Um, I think perhaps more of interest to underwater photographers is the question how slow you can go with shutter speed when working with flash. Yeah. And ultimately, we, you know, we want to go slow while still getting a good exposure. Right. And I think that's where people often go wrong, but there's some really interesting effects. So the first thing that I was saying, Adam's already alluded to it when we're talking about available light shooting, is that if you are a good diver and you're really on top of those skills, you might be surprised how slow you can shoot with flash and um, an available light balanced in a picture and yep. get a really sharp result. Yep. And you know, not uncommon for good divers to get photos commonly slow as a 20th of a second, and even down to even half second exposures in really extreme conditions and still get completely sharp and very usable backgrounds in their wide angle shots. Now, obviously if it's bright, you don't need to use those settings, but if it's dark and you want to open up that background, you want to expose that background nicely, you might be surprised how slow you can go by keeping the camera stationary because the burst of flash remains instantaneous. So your foreground will remain really sharp. And then as long as you can hold the camera reliably still, Yep. So that background should stay reasonably sharp as well. And because it's the background, if there's a little bit of blur in it, it won't matter too much. Yep. But generally, my approach is when I'm pushing those limits, I'll take a series of photos of the same scene and then I'll keep the one where I've managed to hold the camera most still and therefore have a really nice sharp background. Yeah, I think, and the, you know, one of the other things from a compositional point of view, if you're using this technique, make sure that your background is not moving too much. You know, if you've got a shoal of fish in the background that are moving around, then they will blur. So you've got that problem as well. So generally that works best with, with backgrounds that are static, um, like the water, like, like the flow of the water, like a reef, a, a reef that's not actually kind of moving around. If you've got stuff moving around, it will blur. Uh, yeah. 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 So if you are going to, though, if you're, um, but, um, the way a flash is triggered within a photo um, it depends on within a long exposure whether you fire the flash at the beginning or the end of the exposure. 
yeah. the beginning of the exposure is normal, and that's yeah. what most cameras default to, and it's called front curtain or first curtain synchronization. Yeah. And then the option that most cameras give you, but not all, is to fire the flash at the end of a long exposure, which is called rear curtain or second curtain synchronization. And the advantage of that second curtain synchronization is if you are holding the camera still and your subject matter moves during the exposure, your flash fires at the end of the exposure and freezes the subject at the end of that trail of movement. Yep. Whereas if you freeze it at the beginning of the exposure and then the trail carries on, what you end up with is a sharp fish and a blur trail going forward from it, making it look like it's swimming backwards and it's all wrong. Yep. Whereas with rear curtain sync, it can swim through the picture just before the captain and shutter closes, you fire the flash, freeze the fish, and therefore the movement looks very natural. The front of the fish is nice and sharp, and then the back blurs away nicely. So if you are using those long exposures with flash and you're holding the camera still, rear curtain sync is the way to go. Yep. However, if the other advantage of using longer exposures, longer shutter speeds um, with flash, is that you can use that longer shutter speed to intentionally move the camera and create blur and movement in your frame. And if you're doing that, I prefer to use the front curtain or the first curtain sync and have my flash at the beginning of the exposure. And I'll explain why briefly in that if I want to photograph a shark swimming along like this, I want to get my composition absolutely right and then I'll hit the shutter and freeze it with my flash. Yep. I will then pan my camera in the same direction the shark is moving, but faster than the shark. That will create the blur of the shark going backwards across my picture. So it will make the shark feel like it's swimming forwards and then freezing at the end of the picture. So I, I get the advantage of having the composition exactly as I want it. I get the blur from the shark going naturally backwards. backwards yeah. And then the intentional camera movement of the panning or the rotation, or whatever I'm doing, creates lots of camera movement and lots of interesting and artistic and visually unusual blur in my picture and creates a really nice effect. And that I think is one of the really exciting areas of using slow shutter speeds to expose our pictures is it allows us to introduce blur. And I think one of the things photographers love about that is it, it really changes the texture of a scene. It changes the look of a subject. It creates an interesting artistic vision of the subject. And it's always you always get a little bit of surprise because you never know quite how it's going to come out. And yeah. I think that adds to the excitement of the creative process. Definitely. Yeah. I think it's worth sounding a caveat to this point, because um, things like high speed sync, like rear curtain sync or rear. Um, um, yeah, rear curtain sync. Um, these are not available on all cameras um, and similarly are not available on all camera uh, strobe triggering methods so so they're becoming increasingly available but you need to make sure when you look considering these techniques and possibly when you're choosing your 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 strobe um in fact your strobes too the 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 circuit board that you're using to fire the strobes with and the camera itself that they're capable of these techniques it's no point in getting terribly frustrated that you can't do rear curtain sync because you can't find a setting on it only to discover that your camera doesn't support rear curtain sync for example um, so, so it is something that you know isn't available necessarily on everything. But if you've got it, they're great creative tools. So, yeah, yeah for sure. But I, I think it's also why availability of gear like that is why people like me and Adam, you know, recommend certain camera bodies and use ourselves certain cameras because yeah. we've been through this whole process of you know maybe in the past having these bad shots or knowing what the key features of a camera are. And I do think the lesson in that is that. If you're really into your underwater photography, choose a camera body to base your underwater system on that is good for underwater photography, not just the camera body that you fancy buying, yeah. because that camera body will support and give you access to all these techniques that as you grow as an underwater photographer, you want to dive into. Yep. Yep. Great advice. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. So um, I think on Alex's website, you can search by shutter speed. Yes, you, you, you can, I guess, um, if you want to look at some. It's, the difficulty is you need to know exactly what slow shutter speed to search on. So yeah, it's not range, easy to, yeah, to search for. I would suggest if you want to look at some, some slow shutter speed examples, maybe try a search term like long exposure. Mm. That will probably, um, will probably bring up some, some effects and you'll see some images. And that's at amustard.com. So head yes. on over to the website, have a look. Um, lots of ideas for inspiration there. So so great, 
Thank you very much, Alex. Um, that was a, a tour de force uh, um, of uh, a, a big subject in a short period of time. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank um, Inon for sponsoring the episode again. We we really um, appreciate the support that our sponsors give us um, and make these episodes possible. I'd like um, please feel free to add any comments, suggestions in the comments box, and drop us a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again soon.